Hey, how you doing? I'm Van. Welcome back to the only channel on YouTube that thinks that sometimes authors just really don't give a damn. They just want to try to make a quick dollar. Either that or they're crazy. I don't really know. But welcome back. Welcome back to my however many part series on books that are weird with sequels. This go-round, we're going to be covering the sequel to 101 Dalmatians, originally written by Dodie Smith in... 1956. Most people know it from the film in... Most people know it from the Disney animated film in 1961, which was a really huge smash hit, spawning tons of spin-offs and tons of sequels, and none of them mention the actual canon sequel written by Dodie herself. That's, it's always a good sign when Disney is scraping the bottom of the barrel to bring a franchise back to life, and they're still not willing to touch the actual sequel, you know? But yes, it published in 1967, we have... A Starlight Barking, written by Dodie Smith, the direct sequel to 101 Dalmatians. I just want to focus on that. That statement right there is probably going to sound ludicrous in just a few minutes. And I, I just need to be clear, it is the sequel. The same characters, the same people, the same dogs, the same author. Sorry, I, I, I need some hydration. I'm going to drink some of my Aldi brand Coke. That tastes like less than a dollar a can. That's, we love that. Like, I'm not sponsored by Aldi or anything, but like, come on. Y yeah. <laughs> yeah, sponsor this weird guy. I'm sorry. Please subscribe. Let's move on. So the story opens up an indeterminate amount of time after the end of 101 Dalmatians, and we immediately go to see Pongo and the others still at the farm, most of the Dalmatians still there doing their Dalmatian thing. Strangely, however, when the Dalmatians awake, they find that all things, every single other living being on the planet other than dogs, have fallen into a deep trance-like slumber that they cannot be awakened from. Okay. Keep in mind, this is how it opens up. Next, we find out that the dogs can now communicate telepathically through thought waves. We discover this when Cadpig, one of the original 101 Dalmatians, uh, she, she is now the Prime Minister's dog, and the Prime Minister has also fallen asleep. But she communicates telepathically to Pongo and the others, who then decide to select a squad, that's the word they use, a squad, of 50 other Dalmatians who all go to London from the farm. And you may be thinking, well, how, how are they going to do that? Like, London's a pretty big distance. I mean, that's what this book must be about. Out, right? Is there travel to get there? No. No, because they can levitate. More specifically, they can whoosh, which basically just means that they can hover off the ground and fly at almost lightning speeds across the landscape. Like, they get to London fast, like within a chapter. I don't know how long, that. like, they don't talk about how long, but I imagine it was just as quick as flipping the page of the book. Pongo and the others arrive in London and are greeted by Cadpig and her cabinet. Her cabinet, by the way, is made up of the cabinet of the original Prime Minister's dogs. Uh, the, the, the entire cabinet had a dog, thankfully, for just such an occasion. Also worth noting, exactly two cats are awake currently, a white Persian cat, and then a tabby from the movie, I think? Miss Willow, maybe, is her name? I I don't remember. I didn't. I didn't write it down. But they were named honorary dogs. Also, Tommy is an honorary dog, and I don't know who that is. I couldn't find any other details about him, and I didn't read the actual book because I don't have that kind of time. I know it's a children's book, and it would take like 15 minutes, but like, I don't want to like buy it. <laughs> buy it. But these are apparently the only three that were ever named honorary dogs ever. Whatever, you know, fine, sure, let's let's go with that. Anyway, the white cat decides that this is Cruella de Vil's doing and convinces the dogs to... <laughs> She convinces the dogs to go to Cruella de Vil's house and kill her. That's what it says in the text. Like, we are going to kill Cruella de Vil. You remember... You remember whenever they were, like, just trying to get away from her? Now they're assassinating her in the night like demons. They're flying through the air with like knives and guns and stuff. And I think they do have knives, actually. <laughs> anyway, when they arrive at Corella Deville's area, her manor, her mansion, if you will, they find that she's also asleep. She's sound asleep just like everybody else. And instead of furs, she's now become obsessed with like gross plastic consumerism type items. They decide, okay, well, she's wallowing in her own self-pity enough. We'll spare her life, which is again, the word 
words they use. And just as quickly as they arrived at Corella's estate, they returned back to London, when a voice, capital V, that's a W, that's a double V, <laughs> but a voice begins to blare on the television stations all across the area, telling them to bring all dogs to an open, sky-lit area by midnight tonight. They don't question it, they don't really go, oh, who is this? What's happening? Why am I hearing a voice? They go, yes, we gotcha. And so they do. Thousands of dogs gather in Trafalgar Square, I believe it is, and they're just waiting. Like, they're, they're freaking out, they're losing their minds, they're panicking, they're frothing at the mouth, like, begging for somebody to answer why they're there. When suddenly the dog god Sirius descends from the heavens and tells them that he's sad. <laughs> Yeah, no, no, that, that's, that's actually 100% what happens. They gather in the square, they rabble, 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 and the dog god Sirius, from the dog star Sirius, descends from space and tells the dogs that he is lonely and he requires them because he has been without companionship for a very long time. <sighs> Thanks, Aldi. God, what was I talking about? Where was I? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. The dog god Sirius. The dogs question why he's here now, of all times. He's been lonely for all this time, so surely there must be another reason. And Sirius responds by telling the dogs that he's afraid for their lives, because they are his creations. They are those that come from him. And the humans may destroy the Earth with nuclear war. <laughs> and Sirius wants to spare them from that fate. Given the time that this book was published, this could be seen as a commentary on the Cold War a little bit, but, but this, I don't, I don't think this is the place for it, Dodie. Um, I don't think children really understand. <laughs> so the dogs b bicker amongst themselves for a little while, and eventually the decision falls to Pongo, because of course it does. Out of everybody there, it had to be Pongo, because Pongo is the main character, even though he's done nothing in this entire story. Like, he wasn't in, like, the squad to kill Cruella. That was the white cat and a few other scoundrels and ruffians. <laughs> ruffians, get it, because they're dogs? Scoundrels? Like, scoundrels? Oh my god, that's so clever. I'm funny. But Pongo is left to make that decision, and Pongo is about... 50-50, you know, he has a good life, but at the same time he recognizes that a lot of other dogs do not. They are on the streets, or they are hungry, or they are starving, beaten, whatever. But when three strays approach him, and they tell him no dog wants to give up his chance to have a special human of their own, Pongo decides that all dogs can stay on Earth. That's dumb as hell. At least let some of the dogs go. You know, we really don't actually see any conversation happen with Sirius outside of London. Maybe he does this in other places, like he drops down every once in a while and just, like, does this. Maybe, maybe let a dog who's been in a dog fighting ring his entire life and really just aches and whines and suffers all day, maybe let him go to dog heaven painlessly and happily where he can be with a friend for his entire life. Like, maybe let that happen. But no, 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 no. These privileged fucking stupid dogs decide to ruin it for everyone. And cut him a deal and just be like, look, take, take 20%, take, take the, the 20%, let's take a vote, everybody. Why don't they do that? <sighs> anyway, Sirius is sad, but he understands, and he tells them that they can still whoosh for the rest of the night in order to get back where they need to, and nobody will have any memory of this other than the dogs. And Tommy. Whoever Tommy is. Anyway, yeah, that's how it ends. They just go back and everything's normal all of a sudden. It's baffling, isn't it? You know, I, I, I was flabbergasted whenever I first discovered that this existed, and that it was a direct canon sequel to 101 Dalmatians. You could say, again, that it was a commentary on something. I, I think I said this whole spiel about the Willy Wonka sequel in the previous video, but I, I, this... I, <sighs> It's the same thing, you know? It may be commentary, it may be something more than that, it may be an attack, it may be just an avant-garde piece of art that's going way over my head, and maybe it's good and I just, I'm thinking too weirdly about it. My problem isn't the story itself. If this was a standalone thing, it might be a good story, but the concept of a sequel implies the same universe, and this, this is entirely departed. I don't know if she tried to write anything between 101 Dalmatians and A Starlight Barking, but I feel like she probably tried to, and none of it took off the same way as 101 Dalmatians, so she tried to use the characters in another story, and then that flopped as well. That's my headcanon. I didn't do that research. I'm sorry. I'm sorry if I'm slandering Dodie's name. 
but I, it's baffling. It's just, it's got me stumped. Thank you guys so much for watching. I appreciate it tremendously as always. Please make sure you subscribe. It would mean the world to me right now. I'm still going up. I'm still at just over a thousand and I'm, 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 I'm just having a good time, man. The more I do it, the more fun I have with it. The easier it gets to talk in front of this camera like it's a person. That, that took some getting used to. But yeah, y'all have a great rest of your night.